midfoot fractures and dislocations. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Rec Resident Lecture Series version 5. Slides are by Dr. Nicholas Romeo, and I'm Saki Brahman narrating. And uh, in the first video, we talked mostly about anatomy, uh, assessment, imaging, stress views. Um, so now we're going to get more into specific uh, midfoot injuries, starting with the uh, Lis Frank joint injury, the tarsal metatarsal injury. Um, so um, Dr. Lis Frank was a French gynecologist. It was the first to describe amputation techniques through the TMT joint. So the injury pattern in the joints are named after uh, Dr. Lis Frank. These are rare injuries um, uh, and often can be missed, uh, particularly when they're purely ligamentous injuries. So as we showed in the first video, have a high index of suspicion. If you have negative x-rays and you have plantar ecchymosis, you may have to look more carefully. Maybe your x-rays were not as good or interpreted as well, and um, perhaps you have to go back and take another look or get uh, some standing views or stress views or a CT scan to make sure you don't miss a Liz Frank injury. Uh, so if there is concern, but your static x-rays are not that obvious, as we mentioned, get stress x-rays if you need to, standing x-rays with both feet on the same plate. You can do fluoroscopic stress exam, possibly an MRI. Uh, and keep in mind, these can occur with other midfoot injuries, like a cuboid fracture or intercuneiform instability or fractures. So there are some classifications uh, for this. This OTA classification this is the Quenu and Kus classification as uh, demonstrated here, uh, where you have um, sort of this like homolateral or um, sort of divergent uh, dislocation and uh, patterns where you're looking for direction of the uh, displacement essentially. And that can be helpful to describe um, what you're seeing. Um, what do you do acutely? Well, um, reduce the dislocation. Um, so a lot of times you can at least get a provisional closed reduction. If you have severe soft tissue compromise, if you have just a lot of swelling, it doesn't even have to be so severe, but you can look at it and say like, if I open this up, I'm not going to be able to get the soft tissues closed, or I'm going to have to put it under so much tension that it's going to be, uh, problematic. And you have very unstable dislocations, uh, let's say, um, you know, you, 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 you reduce it, but then it pops out again and the skin is under tension. Well, you're probably not going to want to wait until the skin is okay to go and open up everything. Uh, if you know you can get it closed reduced, then, then sometimes that's an indication to just close reduce and pin it. Uh, and then you can always come back, um, and to do definitive treatment later. So, uh, or if you have severe open injuries and you're not sure exactly, you know, where your skin incisions and flaps are going to end up being, uh, then uh, pinning can be very, very helpful as well. So here's some examples of a patient with uh, severe uh, tarsal metatarsal disruption, secondary crush injury, presented six hours from injury. Uh, this patient uh, went to the operating room for close reduction Pinning is shown in the middle. You're already starting to form eschars. You can see this would be highly uh, undesirable to open and do ORIF. And a week later, you have even more extensive uh, uh, skin injury. So uh, this person, if they have a good reduction, could have definitive uh, pinning, uh, for example. Um, so what about uh, definitive treatment? Well, if you have acute ligamentous injury, um, that is no fracture, uh, you certainly can consider arthrodesis. So uh, purely ligamentous injuries treated with arthrodesis in some studies have shown to have higher AOFOS um, patient outcome scores. So that is a consideration to do arthrodesis at that point, as opposed to like just trans articular fixation, um, which would be, you know, ORAF, you're not fixing a fracture, you're sort of just statically fixing across the joints. Um, so when you have fractures, of course, uh, ORAF, um, is going to be more definitive with traversing screws. Uh, sometimes you just have to do transarticular screws across the joint itself. 
Uh, when there's comminution uh, and a screw alone is not going to maintain length, you may have to do a, a spanning plate. Um, and, um, you know, there's a two different ways to do it. Uh, sometimes it depends a little bit on how much your bony involvement is. If it's more comminuted, then oftentimes you have to span these with a plate. And if these are missed and uh, come in late, oftentimes arthrodesis is your mainstay of treatment. So... Um, when you're in the operating room, you certainly are able to do um, a fluoroscopic stress exam, as is shown here. You can see uh, some instability uh, demonstrated, especially at the um, first ray. Um, so a fluoroscopic stress exam. So make sure you really understand your anatomy, as discussed in the first uh, video. Um, it's very critical to have a thorough uh, surgical planning, including your approach, reduction sequence, fixation methods, plan your surgical incisions accordingly. Um, try to maintain a reasonable skin bridge, five centimeters if possible. And oftentimes you're going to do two incisions for a lot of these injuries, one more medial and one more lateral. And here you can see from the AO surgical reference uh, website um, what that approach might look like. So the reduction sequence uh, often is to stabilize from proximal to distal and then medial to lateral. Remember, the medial side is more fixed. The lateral side is more mobile. Uh, always assess for navicular cuneiform and intercuneiform disruption. This may not be that apparent initially um, on initial imaging, but when you get to the operating room, you want to make sure you don't miss that and stabilize that accordingly as well, as is shown here on the right. You can see there's some intercuneiform instability that they've addressed uh, with trend, our transarticular pinning. So thinking back to our columns, though the medial column or the, the sort of first and second column, depending if you think about three columns or two columns, but the medial side uh, and the first, second, and third rays are fairly rigid. So when you fix them, you can fix with fairly rigid fixation, transarticular screws, transarticular plate, um, depending on how much you need to, uh, you can see there's some intercuneiform instability here. Uh, there's some instability uh, coming all the way out to the uh, naviculo um, cuneiform joint, so pretty long spanning plates here. Um, and on the lateral side, you generally will do flexible fixation. Remember, this is the more mobile side, so we don't really want to have really, really rigid fixation, and you're going to end up taking those out in every case. So Pins tend to work really nicely. Uh, they can provide temporary fixation, and then you can remove them at about six weeks. So outcomes. Um, average AOFAS score, uh, as shown here, reported in JBGS uh, 2016. The accuracy of reduction does correlate with clinical outcome, uh, as it is the case with many lower extremity articular injuries. And um, we mentioned this previously that uh, there is some limited data to suggest that purely ligamentous injuries have superior outcomes when treated with arthrodesis over ORIF. Um, so that is uh, something to consider when you have the pure ligamentous injury. So implants can be symptomatic. You're on the dorsum of the foot. You have these transarticular plates and screws. Um, so there is a higher rate of secondary surgery for either implant removal or going back to do arthrodesis when you do RIF versus arthrodesis. So arthrodesis tends to be a more definitive treatment. Um, doesn't mean everybody is going for secondary surgery, but it, it is higher. Um, Midfoot arthritis is, we already mentioned, uh, outcomes are associated with reduction. So um, that, that, that can play a role here as well. And you can see here, in this case, some development of uh, midfoot arthrosis after a Liss Frank injury. Okay, shifting gears to tarsal navicular fractures. These are fairly rare. Uh, these are traumatic fractures, most commonly associated with other midfoot trauma. Here you can see an example of a displaced uh, navicular body fracture. And... Um, you will see these uncommonly. They can also happen as stress fractures. So a lot of times in athletes, you may come across a navicular stress fracture, and treatment for that is somewhat controversial. Um, 
Acute fractures uh, include avulsion fractures, tuberosity fractures, body fractures. The AO classification attempts to look at this as well, as shown here. Um, CT scan can be really helpful, all right? So that can really demonstrate the degree of uh, displacement and uh, injury, and you can see an example shown here. Uh, so stress fractures um, have traditionally been treated with uh, non-surgical management, six to eight weeks in a short leg cast. Uh, there has been some uh, evidence to suggest operative management um, can be helpful as well. Uh, avulsion fractures typically treated non-surgically. Um, so navicular body fractures, um, if you have non-displaced fractures, these can be treated non-surgically, or if you have just isolated fracture without articular involvement. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, displaced articular involvement, unstable medial column, uh, and if you have a navicular fracture in addition to like a list frank injury, then you often have to consider operative management. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, it's important to have a thorough surgical plan with your approach, reduction sequence, and fixation methods. Here you can see interfragmentary screws as well as dorsal plating. So simple fractures can often be treated with simple osteosynthesis and lag screws, although occasionally you may have uh, the need to use mini fragment plates and comminuted fractures. Uh, and sometimes you even have to span to the cuneiforms or talus. So post-traumatic arthrosis is the most common sequela after these injuries. Um, these are complex fracture patterns. Uh, they can result in long-term disability. Osteonecrosis and nonunion and deformity are also potential risks. So navicular dislocations can also occur. These are pretty rare. Um, these should be reduced, of course, and oftentimes can be transarticular pinned um, to prevent further skin compromise. Um, definitively, unfortunately, these you know, often will require um, spanning plating. Um, so here you can see once the soft tissue swelling has gone down and you're able to go in and reconstruct these, uh, you may need to uh, span that medial column to you know, maintain length and also make, make sure the navicular doesn't um, pop back out again. So... Um, so how far you go depends on the injury pattern. Uh, and uh, you often will end up having to go back and remove that at uh, two to four months. Cuboid fractures. So these most frequently occur in conjunction with uh, other midfoot injuries, uh, have a high index of suspicion for uh, TMT uh, ligamentous or other midfoot fractures. When you see these, um, there is a um, fracture pattern called nutcracker fracture uh, that you will hear about. And... Um, it's important to maintain lateral column length, as mentioned in the first video, which often might be um, achieved through uh, fixation of the cuboid in certain cases. So CT scan is really helpful for operative planning to understand where the articular impaction and comminution is. Uh, OTA um, AO classification does um, help to classify this. Um, so if you've isolated minimally displaced cuboid fractures where you've maintained lateral column length, these can be treated non-surgically. But if they're displaced and you have a shortened lateral column, that's going to affect gait, and those are cases where you will need to go in and fix these. Now, uh, typically that's going to be with open reduction internal fixation. Sometimes if you have a really hard time maintaining length or if you have bad soft tissue injury or bad skin, you may have to do a lateral column external fixation to maintain length. Um, these can also be used as a distractor just to get length intraoperatively, but occasionally in a patient with bad soft tissues, you may have to leave that in place. Um, and uh, if you can't just do direct osteosynthesis, if you have a severe crushing injury, uh, then you may have to actually span across the lateral column with a lateral column plate. And, uh, you know, the lateral column we said is, you know, typically, especially the, the Lutz Frank side, fairly mobile, so you often have to go remove that plate. Arthritis at the calcaneo cuboid joint, as well as the fourth and fifth tarsometatarsal joints, is not well tolerated. Shortening is not well tolerated. Um, so outcomes are somewhat dependent on the severity of the injury, and more simple fractures tend to do better. Uh, than the more severe comminuted fractures. Cuneiform injuries. 
So these occur, but rarely in isolation. So we saw already in the section we were talking about list frank injuries that these occur in conjunction with those um, in, in many cases. So you have to look for those. Uh, they could potentially occur, occur in isolation. Um, if you are uh, not sure, if there's an instability, you may have to get a stress examination. CT scan of course, is, again, very helpful to uh, best evaluate these. Uh, Non-operative management can be considered for isolated non-displaced fracture, but for displaced uh, fractures and those occurring in combination with tarsometatarsal midfoot injuries should be treated with operative fixation. So um, that's often treated with um, screw fixation traversing the affected joints. So here you can see on the left plate fixation um, across the first tarsometatarsal joints. Uh, and spanning all the way to the navicular. This could be a spanning plate. If it's a very simple pattern, you could be able to uh, um, fix these with interfragmentary screws or screws uh, into the adjacent kineiform or metatarsal. So to summarize, midfoot injuries are rare, uh, but they are also sometimes missed. Uh, they often uh, are associated with concomitant foot injuries always assess for other injuries uh, with advanced imaging, CT scan, stress x-rays as needed. Um, make sure you understand the anatomy, develop a thorough surgical plan for operative cases, and uh, just be aware and warn your patients that chronic discomfort is not infrequent. Here are the references. Thank you very much.